Um, I chose this title, What is a Folk School? Because it is a question that I get asked very frequently um, when people stop by or when we do presentations or tables around town. So I felt like it was a, a good place to go. Uh, first, I'm going to tell you a little bit about our folk school here. Um, our folk school took root about 11 years ago with a program called Week in the Woods. Um, which is just what it sounds like. It's a wonderful week of camping, uh, making art and craft from the materials that are just readily available in our boreal forest. Um, participants enjoy the community that is created when they come together and make crafts, eat food, share stories together. We officially became the folk school in 2007. And we've been slowly growing the number of classes that we offer, as well as cultivating a community of makers and artists that love to share what they do. Uh, last summer, we pulled up our Goldstream Valley roots and moved right into the heart of Fairbanks, and we are now residing at Pioneer Park. Um, and so there at Pioneer Park, we're in two different buildings. We have a little log cabin behind the Centennial Hall. And then we also have our wood shop out in the, what was the old native museum that's back by the river and the totems. Uh, so we offer a really wide variety of classes at our folk school, uh, woodworking, carving, baskets, all sorts of fiber arts, uh, music, storytelling, gardening, cooking, printmaking, and the list goes on. Uh, but where I want to get started is that just a couple weeks ago, we offered a class called Introduction to House Wiring. Um, and someone stopped by our cabin <coughs> and looked at the list of, you know, upcoming classes, and she said, house wiring? Well, that doesn't seem like something that a folk school would offer. That topic doesn't seem folksy at all. <laughs> and I thought, oh, okay, well, maybe I need to start with uh, some of the basics. <laughs> So I went and I've looked up a couple definitions of folk. Um, so the one that we're all familiar with, I'm sure, is relating to traditional art or culture of a community. So we got folk music, folk art, that totally makes sense. But folk also can refer just to people in general. It might be people, humans. I liked that it said living souls, so I guess dead folk maybe is not a thing. Um, but the last one felt important to me where it says of or originating among the common people. So kind of keep that one in mind. And then school, obviously, an organization that provides instruction. So when I put together folk school, I come up with education for people. House wiring totally falls within that category <laughs> in my mind. So, education for the people. And this is exactly what our guy here, Nikolai Frederick Severin Grootby, and if anyone speaks <coughs> Danish, be sure and correct me. Um, so, he came up with the idea of schools for life, which was really the basis for most folk schools today. Um, Grumpy was a philosopher, poet, theologian, historian, educator, and social critic in Denmark in the early 1800s. He believed that the classical education that was available at that time, mainly to the upper class, of course, uh, which focused on Greek and Latin, was creating a rift between life and learning, that it was looking like two different things instead of together as one thing. Uh, he wanted education to be more than just book <coughs> learning and lectures, and he sought to create an educational system that would instill pride in the local culture and foster a love of, here's a buzzword for you, lifelong learning. Everyone's still hearing that today, but it was Grunpy that was coming up with that a couple hundred years ago. Um, he felt also that schools should bring dignity to the common people. So, of course, at that time, the common people didn't really have any opportunities to go to school. 
Um, at that time, Denmark was also being ruled by a monarchy, and they were starting to think about the transition to democracy. And he really felt that this type of school would help the Danish people build skills and bring about personal enlightenment that was going to be necessary for a peaceable and just society as they <coughs> made that transition. Uh, Grimby believed that to be human is to accept and take pride in one's community, connection, and cultural identity. Uh, another really interesting concept of his that um, I didn't know about until recently, and again, I'm not really <coughs> sure how to pronounce this and couldn't find it online. Shocker. Um, folk, what, say it again. Foka Linen. Ish. Okay. <laughs> anyway, not only is it difficult to pronounce, but it doesn't translate really into English. But what it is, is an alternative to nationalism. So it's a form of patriotism still, <coughs> um, but it is one that values culture and identity while also emphasizing that other nations and cultures are equally valued. Yeah, so that feels <laughs> exactly like something we need some of today. Um, so the schools for life were designed to assist people in understanding first their own identity, which in turn would strengthen and empower communities. So those kinds of concepts are really what folk schools today are still based on. Uh, Grumpy himself did not ever um, open any schools, but a lot of his philosophies were brought to life just a couple of decades later by an educator named Kristen Cold, who founded and ran the first successful schools in the mid-1800s in Denmark. So I'm just going to go over our some of the basic tenets um, that most folk schools operate under. Um, there are no grades, no degrees, no certificates. Um, they are also non-competitive. Uh, Multi-generational groups are welcome. At our folk, folk school, we certainly encourage young and old to be learning the same things together, which creates a really unique environment. Um, he believed that education should embrace the heart, mind, and body, that schools should be free of government control, <laughs> and this is a pretty big one, that the knowledge that's exchanged between an instructor and a student is actually a two-way street. It is not coming from one direction, it's going both directions, and that instructors are not held to a higher level than st and students down below. Everyone works together. And one really great thing that happens when you have that philosophy is that there's also knowledge that gets exchanged between students themselves. So when one person knows a little bit more and this person over here knows a little less, they can say, oh, here, do this. This will help you out. And so it's almost like a three-way exchange going on in the classroom. Um, and he also felt that education should be for all aspects of life um, and lifelong, as I've mentioned. Um, so this was all going on in, in the 1800s, and I just wanted to make sure that I threw in a little bit more uh, modern philosophy. Um, I brought this book along. I don't know if anyone's ever seen it, um, A Handmade Life. The author is William S. Copperthwaite, and um, it's a small volume that has a lot of juicy information, and it, I keep coming back to it over and over again. And I don't know if our public library has this book, but we do have it in our library at the folk school. Um, it's a really good one, but he talks a lot about education and maybe ways that our educational system <coughs> is broken. Um, and I just wanted to throw out a couple of quotes from him that really, um, really bolster a couple of these. So um, up there where it says, the knowledge exchange between instructor and student, 
Copperthwaite says, I suggest we just do away with the distinction between teacher and student. Ideally, we are all learners, <coughs> for even if advanced in some areas, we are woefully ignorant in others. And um, with regard to um, multi-generational groups learning together, he says schools should be for the use of the community as a whole, learning centers for people of all ages and all interests. Perhaps you are thinking that this would detract from the development of the young, but rest assured, if we could create an atmosphere in which learning was exciting and interesting for the adults, this would go a long way toward awakening interest in our children." End quote. So, and he was writing all of this, um, he died a few years ago, but he was writing all of this, um, you know, in the last couple of decades. So, he is not part of the folk school movement, I wouldn't say, but certainly it goes hand in hand with what he's saying. Um, so now I'd like to uh, move a little bit into what happened in the United States. So we had all these Danish and Swedish and then um, the folk school movement spread out through Europe, but what happened here? So in the early 1900s in the United States, a man named John C. Campbell and his wife Olive Dame were studying the mountain people uh, of the Appalachians. They outfitted a wagon and traveled all through mainly the southern Appalachians and um, just talked to people and learned about their agriculture, music, and all the crafts of the region. At that time, there was a real movement afoot to rehabilitate all the people that lived in this area and uh, bring them you know, up to the standards of, that the rest of the country were enjoying. The Campbells were part of this, but when they got there and started talking to people, they realized that what they wanted was to provide some educational opportunities, for sure, that would help people, but they wanted to involve the local community, keep their traditions alive, and make sure that they were enticing the younger generation to actually stay in the area and not move away to the big cities. They wanted to improve the quality of life, but they also wanted to preserve the traditions and then share those with the rest of the world. Um, after John C. Campbell died in 1919, Olive Campbell and then a friend, Marguerite Butler, um, traveled to Europe and studied the folk schools there. Their ideas coalesced. And in 1925, they founded the John C. Campbell Folk School, which was our first one um, in Brasstown, North Carolina. They worked with the lo local people to build a successful program that supported the local economy through craft and through music. Uh, John C. Campbell Folk School remains the largest and oldest folk school in the US. And while their programs definitely center on craft, um, and everyone might just think, oh, that's where I go to learn some crafts. I really want to make it apparent that there's more to it than that. And if you look at their mission statement, it says the folk school seeks to bring people to two kinds of development, inner growth as creative, thoughtful individuals, and social development as tolerant, caring members of a community. So you can see where some of that, like, first the inner growth, and then we're going to spread it out to our community. That that's um, apparent then in the early 1900s, and that's still their mission statement today. The second folk school in the United States that I want to tell you all about is the Highlander Folk School. Has anyone here ever heard of Highlander? Yeah, a little? Okay. Um, so they had sort of a different take on the philosophies of Grundtvi, but definitely their school was based on this. Um, it was founded by Miles Horton in 1932. He was living in Tennessee. Um, he also traveled to Denmark to visit folk schools, and here's what he admired. The informality of their schools, the close student and teacher interactions, 
and their use of culture as a tool for learning. He decided to take this concept back to Tennessee, and I wanted to say again, it was 1930-ish when he was looking at all this. Um, he wanted to bring it back to Tennessee, and he wanted to start a similar school where instructors would work with both black and white students to address the social problems. So, needless to say, that was pretty radical at that time. Um, early on, Highlander really focused a lot on organizing unemployed and working people. They trained a lot of union organizers, but soon found that the civil rights movement was really where a lot of their work was going to take place. And both Rosa Parks and Martin Luther King Jr. both studied at the Highlander Folk School. Um, the Highlander approach to folk education always includes a group of not more than 30 people. They always sit in a circle where they're sharing, reflecting, developing, encouraging, and analyzing with each other. They share culture through food, stories, and music. So even though they are not learning a craft, um, it's utilizing all those underlying currents of the folk school philosophies. So I'm calling it the Highlander Folk School, and you can see what's up here is that it says Highlander Research and Education Center, because here's what happened. In 1961, after years of government investigations, the state of Tennessee revoked their charter as the Highlander Folk School, and they seized all of their land and all of their buildings. You might be able to guess what the underlying motives could have been at that time, but the very next day, they had land donated to them, and they reopened as the Highlander Research and Education Center in Tennessee. They still operate today, um, although, they're still dealing with the same sort of repercussions that they were back in uh, the 1930s and 40s. Last spring, the Highlander Research Center was attacked by an arsonist or multiple arsonists, and the, their main office building was burned down. They lost a lot of artifacts in the fire, and white supremacist symbols were left behind. So there's still a lot of work to do. Um, so the mission statement for Highlander, Highlander serves at a, as a catalyst for grassroots organizing and movement building in Appalachia and throughout the South. We work with people fighting for justice, equality, and sustainability, supporting their efforts to take collective action to shape their own destiny. So these two schools were founded in the early part of the 20th century, and they have managed to survive and thrive throughout the years, but for quite a long time, they were it. There was hardly any other movement in folk schools here in the United States. However, in the last couple of decades, it's been um, a real movement has taken root, and there are new schools popping up all over the country. Um, I've got, oh, one more um, school to tell you about. So the North House Folk School is in Grand Marais, Minnesota. It was founded in 1997, the first year that they offered classes. They had 12 classes. In 1997, so just over 20 years ago, um, this year, they are going to be offering over 350 classes. They uh, will serve over 3,000 students, I believe, and it's people from all over the country and international. Um, so they have enjoyed just like exponential growth that is almost just off the charts. That, it, Grand Marais is a really small town, uh, but they have managed to energize and revitalize that whole area, and now there are artist communities all throughout there and just a community of craftspeople, and I don't think anyone, even the early people involved in North House, would have ever predicted um, that kind of growth. So that's the kind of thing that's happening. And in the Midwest, folk schools are just huge. They're all over. Um, I have a couple of graphs here. I met a person who is actually doing a doctoral thesis on this folk school movement in the United States. 
So you can see, <laughs> until 1991, there wasn't very much happening, but then everything just shoots straight up. And so we're, you know, our folk school is right in there as well. And then here's age breakdown of active schools in the US. So that little sliver of yellow is historic folk schools, so 50 years or more, small number. But that giant slice of blue is schools that have been formed within the last, it says three years here, but she did this last year. So in the last four years, all of those um, schools have been formed. So why? <laughs> why is this happening? Um, so like I said, she is studying it. I kind of have a couple of theories. Um, I think one big one is that we're so embroiled in this digital age and we spend a lot of time doing things that aren't real and looking at things that are not our real life. Um, and I think that finally, some people are coming to the realization that we actually need each other and we need community and we need to make things. So, um, and that we can also derive really substantial benefits from making things and being in a community of people uh, doing that. So, um, that's my theory, but <laughs> I don't have any, um, any studies to back it up. But when you do walk through the doors of the folk school and you put down your phone for a little while and you focus on the music or the craft or the fly casting or the house wiring, you're doing something for yourself, which in turn bolsters your family, your immediate community, and then the greater community. Um, so although many schools in the US rely on craft and music as kind of their foundation, I just really want to reiterate that there's so much more going on just underneath the surface of all that woodworking <laughs> which we've done. Um, the concepts of community, personal enlightenment, empowerment, and cultural memory are some of the threads that really weave the fabric of any folk school. And I believe that folk schools really have the potential to set new standards and inspire renewal and change. So, education for the people. It can mean a myriad of different things, and every folk school has the opportunity to just tweak that definition just a little bit to fulfill the needs of their surrounding community. Um, I'd like to end with one of my very favorite folk school quotes, and I think I've got just some photos. Yay. Um, so again, I mean, this guy Ludwig Schroeder said this in 1872. Uh, about folk schools, and he said, stick your finger down into the ground and smell where you are. This is where the needs of the people are found, which can be different in different times and different places. Where this need meets the abilities of the teacher, therein lies the calling of the folk school. Okay, thanks. Questions? Yeah. I'm curious, what kind of education did you have? Are there places where people can go and become instructors for folk schools? Or what's your background that led you here? Um, well, my personal background, I mean, I do have a background in education, uh, mainly outdoor education. But it was really just my kids taking folk school classes that led me to volunteering. I mean, I had never heard of a folk school before we lived in Fairbanks. And, um, well, maybe that's not true. I maybe had heard of John C. Campbell Folk School before. Um, but, um, and as far as instructors, um, it really, there's not any formal training for most folk school instructors. Um, you really just work with the local community to try and offer classes that either people request that you have 
um, or that someone comes forward and says, hey, I'd really like to teach this. Do you think people would take this class? And we say, well, let's give it a try. So there's not really formal training um, for any of our instructors. Yeah. How can we find out what will be taught? Um, on our website is a great, and our website is <coughs> folk.school. Super easy. Um, I walked out of the house without my, uh, you know, flyers and stuff to share. But um, on our website, it's really easy to sign up for our newsletter, which is honestly the best way to um, keep up to date on classes. And it only comes out every two weeks, so we're not flooding your inbox with anything. Um, a lot of classes fill up somewhat fast, depending on the topic. So um, if you really want to keep up the newsletter, it's a great way. And now that we're in Pioneer Park, you can always walk by. And I usually have an upcoming classes list on the door there, too, even if we're not open. So what happened to the property at Disney? Yes, you're totally out of here. Oh, yeah. Because yeah, I heard that you were in both places. But no, uh -uh. That, we were just renting that. Oh. So it, I mean, I think they just rented it to someone else. We basically couldn't afford it anymore. <laughs> I mean, it's great for us to be in town, too. I mean, sure. um, the access is huge, but it was also a pretty expensive place to be. It was beautiful, but. So you're in the round building? Okay. At Pioneer Park? Yeah. No, the right behind the round building, there's a little log cabin that kind of sits on a knoll is above. It, the dance hall? I can't no. yeah. it is see. adjacent to the dance hall. You know, there's the dance hall, and then there's the square dance picnic pavilion, and then our log cabin. And everyone who comes in is, like, people all the time are like, I don't know what building you're talking about. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and uh, then when you see it, you're going to be like, oh, that log cabin. Now I know what she's talking about. Because it wasn't anything for years and years. It was just storage um, before we moved in. So it's kind of camouflaged there. Yeah. Of the classes? Um, most of our classes uh, run about $12 an hour ish, um, depending on. Um, so a lot of our classes are three or four hours long. So it might be you know, under $40 to take a three hour class. Um, and then we also have much longer lengthy classes like we have um, next spring we have a log cabin building class coming up and that one is $975 but it's two weeks all day every day uh, build a log cabin and that I'm just gonna do a little plug is a really cool collaboration because we're actually building a new public use cabin um, in uh, cooperation with the DNR so um, if any of y'all use the cabins, you know where Nugget Creek is out in the Chena Recreation Area, and it's a pretty rundown little cabin. So we're building a brand new log cabin at Pioneer Park. The whole thing is gonna get taken apart, loaded onto a trailer. It's gonna go out to the trailhead and get snow machined in to the new location, which is at the end of the uh, Mastodon Trail, that new trail that they've just put in out there and then we're going to rebuild the cabin. So it's a really cool class. And there's membership too, right? We do have a folk school membership, which is a great way um, to support the folk school. And it does, at this current time, it does give you um, a reduction on the price of the class. Insider information that might go away sometime in the future and it might be just one single price um, but we still welcome people that want to support us through membership is that your only support is people taking classes do you have other funds coming in? Uh, we do i mean people donate money we um we're still um working on trying to get a business sponsorship and grants you know it like as a nonprofit grows and you realize like oh my gosh 
okay, we don't have very much in the bank account. <laughs> um, and so we're working toward all of that. We do not have a development director. So the fundraising, you know, kind of goes in fits and spurts and, and we hold fundraisers and that kind of thing. But yeah, class tuition does not pay our bills <laughs> for sure. Concept that was built um, back, way back, that it should be equal, equal between instructor and student, and equal input. So I'm thinking, who's paying who, or how? You know, is this all volunteer from both ends? I mean, it is not volunteer. If, if an instructor is considered by the student as that doesn't know it as much or more than that they have something to offer. Right. Well, how can you justify paying that person? But it, it is slightly different. Yeah, I don't know that it's not that they, uh, on that particular subject, yeah. they do obviously know more than, um, especially a beginning student. But I think that um, idea of a two-way street is that students also have something to offer that instructor. Like maybe the instructor is like, this is the best way to do this. And a student has the opportunity to say, hey, you know, I tried it this way and this totally works for me. And that is maybe eye opening for an instructor. Um, or maybe they can, you know, show them something else. So that's what I mean more of a, of an, just an exchange of information. Um, but yeah, our instructors do get paid. Um, at the folk school, they're welcome to volunteer if they would like. Well, and I can see back in uh, what, uh, Einstein's time, but if anybody knows his story, when he was about 14, he went to school. He was not, he had formal education early on. And he challenged, because he did not have formal education, to develop his curiosity and uh -huh. analytical <coughs> skills on his own and not be hammered this is what you learn. Right. So he's challenging his professors and saying, whoa, this does not make sense. Explain it. And, he, and the professors, and of course, old school, you know. You, right. That's what I'm, so that doesn't necessarily work in the dominant educational exactly. paradigm. So I guess that, during that time that this other person would come through and say, whoa, we don't want that. Because right. he, I don't know if he's skipped out, but basically it, it got down to where the professor said, this is the way it is because my instructor told me this is that way. His instructor told him and thought, you know, on right. and on. And I've had that with other children in a school setting that told me, I asked them how to explain this, and they were just totally frustrated and they could not explain it. And they put down the child who was asking a legitimate clarification of this. Uh, but you know, that, the, so that idea that, well, I'm a teacher, just listen to me, no questions asked, just do as I say, right. and just learn by rote and don't think. I, I think that's where the difference is of the, the equal thing. It and, is, yeah. certainly. I mean, I hope that all of our instructors are open to what, you know, ideas that students might have. Yeah, it's just not the same situation there. And the great thing is that when you go to a folk school, everyone signed up to be in the class. Whereas like our typical educational system, needless to say, I don't think that most of our kids would choose to be in that situation. Um, so it creates a completely different environment. Anybody? Yeah? Yeah, um, the move was a pretty big deal and it took almost all the energy and resources that we had, it seemed like at the time. So right now I think that everyone feels like, all right, we're gonna be at Pioneer Park for a little while. Um, but there are definitely lim limitations on both of our buildings. Um, and someday we would definitely like to build our own facility um, but now that we've been in town um, it's like okay well, where can we do that kind of close to where we are right now um, so I mean I think that would be the the big picture but um, certainly uh, getting a little bit more um, financially stable and sustainable 
is going to come first for that. That was my second question. Is have you noticed uh, membership or like attendance increasing since you've been moved to town? Yeah, I mean, kept really more than I expected. Um, the increase in the number of students and more instructors that are willing to teach there. Um, partly, like we have a whole series of ukulele classes this summer um, for both kids and adults, and they're one hour long for like six weeks in a row. So at our old location, that was just way too much. Like no one wanted to come out there six times, you know, one, you know, once a week. And then if it's a kids class, well then the parents really were just stuck waiting, you know, for because where were you going to go besides Ivory Jacks, maybe? Um, so now it's a great opportunity because people can just pop in after work. They've, they're taking a class, and so instructors have the opportunity to offer those shorter classes, which is great. Yeah, it's been a real, uh, a real boon for us, certainly. Has any of your staff there uh, traveled to Europe to visit the old schools and get ideas? No, no, but I would sure like to. <laughs> well, I sent you at least one student, I won't say her name, um, but personally, I know there are tons. Every community in Norway has a uh -huh. school, if not more than one. Yeah. And they, each one, they specialize in what? Something some different. Yeah, like this yeah. is this, like it's visual arts type or pottery mm -hmm. or it's basketry or knitting or weaving or something or it's music or some aspect of music, some uh, genre of music, yeah. or it's acting or it's woodworking or, uh, yeah, there's specialty schools that you could go to. Yeah. And I it mean, is all ages. They start at age, two, 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 uh, I want to say 16. Yeah. Uh, but you can be older. Right. And a lot of their schools over there are residential. So it's, a, it's it is. Uh, yeah, a little it's bit different, true. but I have had the opportunity. I got to go um, and visit the North House Folk School in Minnesota last fall, um, which was fantastic and just so great to see. I mean, just really inspiring and beautiful. And I took a great class. Are they residential? No. Okay. Mm -hmm. None in the US are. Um, John C. Campbell is. Um, and they have multiple buildings there where people stay and you can also camp um, there which makes it pretty affordable um, and then there are a couple of other uh, older mainly Appalachian schools that have the same sort of residential model but not you know for like a week not a whole semester or a year like those European schools are yeah yeah there's a big uh, international folk school summit coming up in Denmark in the fall <laughs> But I was like, well, yeah. <laughs> maybe I could justify that. <laughs> yeah, I'll have to get a grant. It's, it's for much that. with the concept of education that I've had for decades. Uh, and actually, I'm teaching at the Fairbanks Some Arts Festival with these concepts in mind. Oh, uh, excellent. Before I even heard all this. Right. And I in mean, these mixed ages, I want parents and their children, families, yeah. and whatnot. If anybody's interested, I've, I got information here with me. Cool, yeah, I mean, summer arts is very similar, for sure, with that um, just lifelong learning. Um, it's great, yeah. Okay. Any other questions? Awesome, thank you.